There are a lot of myths and rumors and methods of wiring schoolies, but with a little bit of information and experience, you can save a ton of money and make fewer mistakes. I've got a client right now that's wiring up their bus and they're overwhelmed and confused. And while there are tons of resources out there, there are a lot of things are not, that are not schoolie specific. So today I'm making a video for that client and I figured I might as well go ahead and get this video together. It's something I've been thinking about for a while to help my clients better wire their buses. So if that sounds interesting to you, take a look. One of the things I do with my company is I do consults and I help people design solar systems and uh, power their buses based on the needs that they have or their expectations. Inevitably, this means that they're going to have to wire their bus with both AC and DC wiring. And while I haven't done a video and I don't charge for that portion of the consult, I've been helping all my clients one-on-one -on -one as best I can. Every time I make a video, it is basically to um, make a video that I can copy and paste to them to answer the questions that I wind up answering all the time. So today I'm gonna to go through some AC and DC wiring information and explain a few of my practices that'll both save money and allow you to have a better system. Your typical residential electrician speaks one language. They speak AC power. Today we are gonna call that house power because it gets confusing with AC, uh, meaning air conditioning. And so house power is the best way to say it. Yes, I realize you have a house system and a house battery, but I will reference AC to house power to make it simpler. That is at 120 volts. Oftentimes people will call it 110, 115, but the reality is 120 is what it's supposed to be at. You're only gonna see 110 if you have a really long wire run and you're pulling power from it. So the optimal is 120 volt. I'll refer to it as such. The next is DC. This is gonna be battery and that's gonna be 12 volt or 24 volt in a bus. People are now doing 48 volt, not a fan. That's a whole nother video, um, but it's not saving people money and it's giving them less optimal systems most of the time. Now the next basic is gonna be wire size. AWG is the standard American wire gauge, I think is what it stands for. And so it's a confusing system that goes four slash zero, which is pronounced four aught. Okay, that's the, and this diagram, that'll be the largest. So four aught is the largest. Then next one down, two aught, one aught, zero aught. That's kind of your middle line. At this point, the numbers start going the opposite direction from larger to smaller, okay? So 14 is about the smallest I wind up using in a bus for, for a handful of reasons. We'll get there in a bit. This wire size guide is consistent and works with both AC and DC. That's common language. But when you get into Romex versus stranded, Romex being your typical residential solid copper like this, this is a 14.2, okay? So that's gonna be on the smaller wire size for AC power. It is three wires, or two wires and a ground. They call this 14.2, 14 being the wire thickness, two being the number of uh, wires, but they're not counting the ground as a wire. Well, when you get into stranded, the marine stranded like this, you're looking at three wires, they're counting the ground as one. So this would be called 12 slash three but these wind up being the same thing. So solid copper versus stranded. Now on the DC side of wiring, you're going to be using two wire. That's gonna be your typical red and black. And this is called tin two. Uh, tin being the wire thickness, which is larger than those two, two being the number of wires. That's typical positive, negative, and this gets a fuse. So this is where I'm gonna take a detour and dispel some of the rumors. A lot of people are very passionate about only using stranded wire like this in mobile application. And it is a standard for like um, boats and such, right? Totally fine with that. It's way more expensive and I like it. It allows you to use smaller gang boxes and they bend really easily, but you do have to terminate each end with like a spade connector to connect it to the receptacle. Whereas the alternative is gonna be using your standard Romex. Now this is the skinniest one. Uh, which is pretty easy to work with. Once you get into size 12, which is what I actually recommend for everything, they're a bit harder to work with. You're gonna be fighting it a little bit in gang boxes, the smaller ones. Um, but the reality is either can be used. A lot of people are very passionate about this and they say that you're gonna have failures with a Romex. The reality is in five years of being in the schoolie world and being in hundreds, if not a thousand buses, uh, I've never seen a failure with 
Romex being used like this. That said, there are limitations, right? With these smaller flexible lines, when you make sure you secure everything, there's not a lot of um, vibration or like shaking, dangling on the wires, it's not a problem, okay? I've never had these get loose at the terminals, like at a receptacle. But when you get into larger wire sizes like this, this would be like size 10, now you're getting into like really rigid cables and bending those and making a secure contact like into an inverter or something, it gets a bit hairy. So this is my line. I don't go beyond, I don't go up to this size, which is size 10. At size 10, I'm gonna be using 10-3-S-O-O-W. You can get that at Lowe's. I use that from the shore power inlet to the panel slash to the inverter. One of the things I think is not necessary in the schoolie world is using a bunch of different wire sizes. You could wind up having different circuits that you could use six, 10 different wire sizes technically, or would it be better just to buy one roll of size 12 to Romex, fit 250 foot roll and wire the whole bus, all the same breakers and keep it simple. I much prefer that method. It makes a lot of sense to me. So with that path, 120 volts, it's about wire size, right? So you can go with the 14, which is the, this white one in Romex, and it's just fine. However, 14 is rated for 15 amps. So you get 15 amps times the voltage, 120 volts, and you get 1800 watts, okay? 1800 watts. And you're wiring your bus kind of like a house where you have a set of circuits. So you may have three circuits on that. So if you're at 1800 watts to your kitchen, that means when you're running a coffee pot, coffee pot, water boiler, it's gonna be 1400 watts. That means if you were running this, the coffee pot or a water boiler, and then you were using like a dicer or a blender, you may overrun that circuit, right? And so, not a big deal, it can be done, and it's just flipping a breaker, not a problem. Whereas, if you instead use a 20 amp, that's a size 12, right? We were talking about, instead of using the 14 two, we're gonna use the 12 two. That's the larger one. 20 amp times 120 volt equals 2400 watts. That's ideal and it's simpler. So rather than wire part of your bus up with 15 amp, with uh, the 14 two, then part of yours with the 12 two, I recommend doing the entire bus in 12 two to keep it simple. Or in the case of marine stranded, that would be 12 three. Now part of the reason for this is that if you're going to install mini splits, they require a 20 amp circuit. So now you would have two of your circuits already getting 20 amp. I just assume go ahead and do this whole bus. And what is the cost difference? It's like maybe 40 bucks or something for the entire bus, not a big deal. Keeps it simple, you're on common breaker sizes, and now your entire bus has a greater capacity at each circuit. Not a deal breaker in any way, but that, those are the numbers, now you can choose your own adventure. Now on the DC side, DC gets a lot more specific with wire sizes, right? So maybe you're able to run, um, say something with a high draw, like a diesel heater, let's say, for five feet, you can run that with size 14 just fine without having any voltage drop, right? But if you're gonna run the full length of the bus, you probably need to be closer to 10. After five years in the community, I've come up with simpler methods of doing things. So I basically get a roll of 14.2 Marine Stranded, and I wire up all of the 12 volt items with that. So that's all of your LEDs, totally fine. You, you'd have to stack up like 20 LEDs on one circuit in order to outrun that. Water pump, totally fine on size 14. Um, pretty much everything. Fridges, if you want to be doing 12 volt fridges, which I do not recommend, um, but that can basically be done on 14. Now you're gonna have a fuse, and so if you overrun it, the fuse blows, and now you have to make a change. But typically, everything gets run on 14, except for high draw items, or items that are way at one side of the bus versus the other. Now I'll address that whole long run circumstance in a moment, but say a diesel heater, I just go ahead and put every diesel heater on a size 10, even if it's just five foot, because they get a little bit picky with voltage drop. Another really common mistake that is not ideal for buses is using a residential panel like this. They take up a lot of space, 
There's some additional complexity that allows them to have 240 volts, and in most circumstances, you do not need 240 volts. So um, you spend 80, 100 bucks on something like this, and usually a residential electrician will even wire them wrong and cause your bus to be electrified. The entire shell will, be, will have a hot skin. So say you spend 80 or 100 bucks on this, then you go buy one of these, you see this everywhere uh, from the affiliate link guys, you pay $55 for this, I believe. So now you're up to something around 150 bucks for this setup, and you can do that, but it is not ideal, especially since there are RV options like this that take up less space, they mount flush and are much cleaner. You get all the same fuses, fuse protections here, and then you get uh, six circuits right here for your system. Now, one of these will be used for your main coming in from your inverter, which leaves you with one, two, three, four spots for circuits. Now, you can do tandem breakers on these, which allow you to have two, four, six, eight circuits. And frankly, if you're doing a bus with more than eight circuits, you just have huge, huge power needs. And sometimes that's a reality, but I've done 40 foot buses running full-time air conditioning and everything else. I've never had a bus that actually needed more than this. And this costs $82 on Amazon. You get both, you use up less space. It's much simpler. It's cleaner. It's got strain relief already built into it. So Romex is something you can get at Lowe's. The 10.3 SOOW for shore power, you can get that at Lowe's. Uh, Home Depot, I prefer Home Depot. But um, all the other things I would avoid getting locally. You're gonna spend so much more on lugs and cable and it's gonna be the wrong cable. So for example, THHN, that's this right here. If you can see it, that is I think 19 strands. It's quite rigid. Uh, not that flexible, holds its shape. This is two watt, I'm sorry, two gauge. Meanwhile, this is the same thing and it's stranded. So the inside of this looking like that, right? So a bunch of strands, I don't know, maybe a hundred or something. It's a lot. Well, as it turns out, if you try to go put your system together with this, we're just going to rip all that stuff out later and replace it with the proper stuff because this cannot handle the amps. The THHN, that's this stuff here, using residential 2AWG, which is this size, can handle 130 amps, and that's like its max. And I'm not sure what the distance is that it's handling that, but it's not that, that far. Whereas welding cable, this stuff here, that handles 200 amps constant before, and the amp rating is based on at, which, at what point the sheath, outer sheath melts, essentially, right? And so this is rated for 200 amps up to, up to like 50 feet which is round trip. So that would be 25 of black and red uh, to your destination. So this is what you should be using. Now, the crazy thing is this is convenient because it's local, but this cost me, I, I bought this one foot piece today and it was like 390 for one foot. This stuff here, the proper welding cable, this two AWG is gonna be under $2 a foot. It might maybe even be like 150. So like, what are we doing? We're just spending money in the wrong places. So get the right cable. And, uh, and actually, once you start understanding this, you can do a little bit of cheating. I actually don't follow the exact specs of something like Victron installs. They require um, large wires in some circumstances or in most of their circumstances. But what they're really doing is they're accounting for people making mistakes like this. So a little bit of the cover your ass policy. So once you understand the rules, you can uh, wiggle and break them a bit safely. Now, at some point, I am gonna do a more comprehensive video on this. I'm gonna have a full install video for my clients to help them run through the whole thing. A lot of this I cover in the console and really I just have them write down the wire sizes that I recommend. It makes it simpler and they don't have to understand everything in order to install it safely and properly. Again, at this point, I've done over 100 buses and it's been very difficult to keep up with the demand and my responses are sometimes getting slow because um, I just, the demand's too much and it is just me. But after a bit, I'll do this more comprehensively. We'll go over 12 volt versus 24 and why 48 volt is in general a mistake in buses and isn't saving you money, which is really most people's intent is to save money, but it doesn't do that. And there are a lot of costs that people don't realize with that. So um, if you've got any questions, reach out for a consult. Uh, we go through the entire thing. We figure out what your power needs are, what your expectations are, and we'll map out an entire system based on that and based on 
100 plus buses on the road traveling full time. So we don't have to do any guesswork. We don't have to speculate based on what you're reading online with the, with the charts where you get to put in your watts and watt hours and how many hours it's running. I find most of that very unuseful and the numbers don't actually add up to what's practical for bus life and what I've seen over the years. So by having a basic understanding of this and going through the console and getting some understanding, we actually wind up saving money, having a better system that will not have to be redone. And everything's more simple because you're using fewer wire sizes, fewer lug sizes, few sizes, breaker sizes, and you wind up with a superior system. And with all the savings, maybe you were on the fence about using a low quality product like Renogy versus a high quality product like Victron. So we do this, all this saving across the whole board of, um, of a school bus build, and you wind up actually being able to spend the same amount in most cases and get a much superior system that allow you to be fully off grid.